We're very fortunate to have Dean Gold with us today. There is no one more qualified to discuss with us the relevancy and in particular the value of a legal education than Dean Gold, who has been involved in legal education in a variety of capacities since he first began teaching in 1980. Dean Gold is the Fritz B. Burns Dean and Professor of Law at Loyola Law School, where he has taught since 1984. He is also Senior Vice President of Loyola Marymount University. Prior to teaching at Loyola, Dean Gould was a tenured faculty member at Arizona State University, and he practiced in Los Angeles. He is an exceptional teacher, having earned the Excellence in Teaching Award from the graduating class of 2007, and he is an expert and scholar on the rules of evidence, advocacy, and contract law. He has written numerous books and law review articles on topics in evidence, and my personal favorite, federal civil procedure and practice. <laughs> He was the CBS Legal News Consultant from 1994 to 1997 and has continued to provide legal commentary for a number of news outlets, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, CNN, and many others. Under Dean Gould's leadership, Loyola's curriculum has been transformed to recognize that what we do here is to ad hopefully adequately train you to be um, practitioners. The curriculum now emphasizes skill training and provides numerous opportunities um, for students to work with and learn from practitioners. Under his leadership, Loyola has developed concentration programs in many critical areas of the law, and these concentration programs combine classroom learning with both clinical and mentoring opportunities. A number of centers and institutes have been created under Dean Gould's tenure, including the Alarcon Advocacy Center, this center contains a number of criminal law clinics, including the Capital Habeas Litigation Clinic, where students work with public defenders on habeas petitions filed for prisoners on California's death row. I think as the foregoing demonstrates, Dean Gould has devoted his professional life to ensuring that law students are well prepared and trained to undertake the responsibilities of the legal profession. Please join me in welcoming Dean Gould. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. Uh, I know uh, you are about to enter your final exam period. I remember what it was like when I was a first year student. And so my talk is about giving you some perspective as you begin this difficult period. And, and the title of my talk is all you really need to know as a lawyer, you already learned in kindergarten, uh, plus a little that you've learned in your first year of law school. So uh, you know the cliche is in law school, we teach you how to think like a lawyer. But the reality is that's only a very small part of what you need to know to be a lawyer. Um, the LSAT, that measures your capacity, supposedly, to think like a lawyer. Uh, the exams that you're about to take, again, are trying to measure your capacity to think like a lawyer. But the most successful lawyers that I know didn't do especially well in law school or on the LSAT. But they excelled once they got out into the real world. And it's because they knew how to do some other things. Namely, they knew how to deal with people. And they knew how to solve problems. They knew how to build relationships. So ironically, some of the folks who are the best at thinking like a lawyer hated the practice of law, hated being lawyers. Of course, we called them law professors. <laughs> so, um, so what's missing from law school? What's missing from your experience this year uh, that you're going to need to be a successful lawyer? It's mostly stuff you learned as a kid, common sense things. 
The problem is, um, in the process of your first year of law school, we beat most of this out of your head. Uh, and so I am here to gently reinsert it and reboot all of you. So uh, to start, I want to um, have you reflect back a little bit on this year, this first year of law school. How is it that we changed you? Uh, and, un and unfortunately, as some of the collateral damage of teaching you how to think like a lawyer, how is it that we removed some common sense lessons you knew uh, you learned as a kid? Um, uh, I can tell you, in my case, by the time I reached your stage of first year of law school, uh, nobody in my family wanted to talk to me anymore. Because I had changed in a way that didn't, uh, didn't especially make me easy to, um, to, do, to deal with. And, and so why, why is that? What happened in this first year? Um, here's what happened. All of your classes used a text that we call a casebook. Uh, we taught you law almost entirely by discussing lawsuits. And so naturally, what you take out of that experience uh, is the belief in an adversarial model of dealing with legal problems. Uh, so this means that uh, when you're dealing with other people, friends, family, strangers you meet, now what do you do? You stake out a, a position, uh, you advance your argument, you try to make the most compelling case you can, uh, uh, make it better than the argument of your adversary, even if the person you're talking to is the kid behind the counter at Starbucks, right? So you, you've become, uh, or at least I'll speak about myself, I became a rather unpleasant person by the end of the first year of law school. Um, but I discovered, and maybe you've discovered, this, doesn't, this approach might work in a courtroom, and, and your professors expect you to be able to demonstrate this ability in the classroom, but it doesn't necessarily work well anywhere else. And so this, that might have, by the way, explained the state of my love life as a first year law student. So one problem with trying to extend this approach, this adversarial approach, in all the rest of these contexts, outside of the classroom, outside of the courtroom, the adversarial approach works only in a very structured environment. A courtroom, you have a judge up here. There are a set of rules that all, everybody knows and has to adhere to. Uh, people make their arguments, and then the judge declares a winner. Um, that's not how the rest of the world works. And that's not how the world in which lawyers operate works either, except when they're in a courtroom. So um, you may have noticed when you in, involve or you use this approach outside of the classroom, it's not necessarily working very well for you. Uh, when you uh, when you, when you take that adversarial approach, what's the reaction of the other side? It's typically not to be convinced that you're right. It's typically become adversarial in return. And so it doesn't really work well when you're outside of the courtroom. And lawyers are mostly in these other contexts. You, they have to deal with their partners to get their partners to agree to things. They have to negotiate a deal, make the deal seem acceptable to all sides. Uh, when lawyers do virtually anything out of a courtroom, they need a broader set of skills. Uh, so that's one thing we've done to you in law school that uh, you need now to take some pers uh, have some perspective on. 
this adversarial approach, this litigation mindset does not necessarily work any place but a courtroom. The other thing that's happened in law school this first year, we have taught you to be a skeptic, to question everything. And to some extent, that's a good thing, because lawyers have to be skeptical. They have to scrutinize documents and size up the adversary and, and be skeptical about the deals that clients are presented with, uh, and, and in many situations. Learning to think like a lawyer, be critical, uh, is important. So lawyers are trained, you've begun the training, to approach every problem with this mindset. What could go wrong? Um, so we've called, we call that critical thinking. But there are many situations you will be confronted with as a lawyer where building something like a relationship, building something like trust, is more important than thinking about what could go wrong. And so that, that approach, that mental approach that we have been uh, sticking into your brain this year, that what's called critical thinking here in law school, in many situations you will confront as a lawyer, will just be viewed as negative thinking and will not build the relationship, it will not make the deal, it will uh, not accomplish what you need to accomplish. Uh, and something else to keep in mind about this notion that we've made you skeptical, a skeptical, critical thinker, there's a very fine line between being a skeptic, which you need to be to some extent as a lawyer, and being a cynic. So a skeptic questions things, and you need to question as a lawyer. A cynic believes in nothing and no one. And so while you need to be a skeptic, you should be careful that you don't cross the line into becoming a cynic. All right. So. Um, I know now, after uh, almost your first full year of law school, it's hard to believe that lawyers do anything other than fight and argue. Um, as I've said, you know, we've been teaching this to you all year with these case books. Um, this is what you learn. Uh, if you watch the TV shows uh, involving lawyers, they're always fighting, they're always arguing. Um, by the way, also on the TV shows, the lawyers are always beautiful and have great hair, right? And most lawyers look like me. So uh, that vision of what lawyers do or need to do that you see on TV and in the movies is no more realistic than the appearance of the actors playing lawyers. So what I want to do now after I've sort of described to you what we've done to you in the first year. Um, I want to reboot your brain a little bit and reinstall some of that common sense that you came to law school with. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to begin doing that by referring to a book that was published about 27 years ago. It was the bestseller for two years in the United States. Uh, it was called All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Um, uh, the author is Robert Fulgham, and he, he said there were 16 things that we all learned as children that are pretty much all we need to know in life. Uh, and I want to suggest to you that almost everything you need to know as a lawyer is captured in these ideas as well. So he, here are the 16 things he said. Share. Play fair. Don't hit. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. 
Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Here's a good one. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and drink some and draw some and paint some and sing and dance and play and work every day. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic, hold hands, and stick together. Be aware of wonder. Remember the little seed in the styrofoam cup? The roots go down, the plant goes up, and nobody really knows how or why. And we're all like that. Goldfish and hamsters and white mice and even the little seed in the styrofoam cup, they all die, and so do we. And then finally, remember uh, uh, the first uh, readers you had. Uh, in my era, they were Dick and Jane books. Maybe, I don't know what they were in your era. But one of the first words you learned in those readers was maybe the biggest word of all, look, look. OK, so what the heck does any of this have to do with learning to be a lawyer? Um, a few years ago, uh, two professors at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Marjorie Schultz and Sheldon Zedek, published a study identifying the factors that make for an effective lawyer. And their conclusions were based on years of gathering data from thousands of lawyers and judges and clients and law students, law professors. Uh, it was an immense study. And included in their factors of what it takes to be an effective lawyer were the critical thinking skills you've been learning this year. So it's not that they're irrelevant. They're crucial. They're important. But there were a bunch of other things they identified as central to being a successful lawyer. And most of those other things are just like those lessons we learned in kindergarten. So here's what Schultz and Zedek had to say about what their studies what their study showed it takes to be a successful lawyer. Um, successful lawyers can resolve disputes to the, to the satisfaction of everyone concerned. Or I would say, they've learned how to share. Successful lawyers manage, train, and instruct others to realize their full potential. Uh, they establish quality relationships with others to work toward their goals. Or in other words, they hold hands and they stick together. Uh, lawyers, successful lawyers have core values and beliefs. They act with integrity, honesty. Or in other words, they play fair. They don't hit. They say I'm sorry when they hurt somebody. Successful lawyers are able to develop relationships with clients that focus on the client's needs. Another way to say this is don't take things that aren't yours. Successful lawyers contribute their legal school skills to the community. And I describe this as clean up your own mess, and the community's mess is our mess. Successful lawyers, uh, the study showed, accurately perceive what is being said, both directly and subtly. They communicate effectively in light of the audience being addressed. So they read their audience. 
They pay attention to their audience, and that dictates how they communicate. They're able to see the world through the eyes of others. Or another way of saying this, as uh, I said about the lessons we learned in kindergarten, look, pay attention. Effective lawyers, the study showed, if, uh, manage pressure or stress. Or in other words, they live a balanced life. They have cookies and milk. They take a nap. Effective lawyers, the study showed, demonstrate an interest in law for its own merits, not just because it produces a nice income. Or, as the kindergarten book said, be aware of wonder in the world. Uh, and in fact, uh, I'm going to close with this thought. The law is a wondrous thing. The profession that you're going to be a part of uh, is something special. You can be proud of what you're going to be and what you can do as a lawyer if you make yourself the sort of lawyer I've just described. Uh, people in crisis will be able to come to you for help. And here's the wonder part. You will have the power to give them that help. In fact, you will have the power to change society itself. Lawyers have been at the center of every major social advance in American history because they view the community's mess as their mess. So you should be proud of what you're going to become. Show pride in, uh, show pride in professionalism every day in the classroom. Practice these additional skills that you know you're going to need when you become a real lawyer. Um, becoming a lawyer is going to be one of the hardest things you've ever attempted, but it's going to empower you to do and be far more than you ever thought possible. Uh, and then finally, the last word, always remember, flush. All right, folks, thank you. And, and I'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions or uh, comments. Uh, don't make me call on someone. <laughs> well, you're, you're making eye contact with me. <laughs> so. You know, um, and, and I, I don't want to extend the analogy to uh, childhood unduly, but how did any of us learn how to ride a bike? How did any of us learn how to swim? We got on the bike, right? And we fell off a few times. So um, even if we were scared to go in the pool the first time, we did it, and eventually, we learned. So the, the thing about networking is you have to do it. Uh, even if you feel kind of um, uh, nervous and tongue-tied, the more you do it, the more relaxed you will be. And so you know, the question everybody has is, you know, here's, a, here's a lawyer, here's somebody I should meet. I go up to them, introduce myself. What, what, do, I, what do I say? What do I talk about? The, the, the best thing you can do is to ask someone about themselves. Ask them about their practice. Ask them, you know, what was law school like for them? Whatever. Ask them to open up to you. 
And, once, and people love to talk about themselves, especially lawyers. So you do that, and, it'll, and the conversation gets going. And now, among the other things you, you, you've done, you've, you're starting to learn something about that person. And that, that leads to the next question and the question after that, or the opportunity for you to say something about yourself that establishes a connection. So don't be afraid and show interest in the other person. Yes? So how do you get your first award? Let's say um, you don't have that type of a resume or GPA, but you have all of these wonderful kindergarten essentials. Right, right. <laughs> well, uh, you've got the opportunities that the school will make available to you. There will be networking opportunities. Alumni come here. Um, uh, but utilize every connection you have. So if you have friends or family that know lawyers or know people in business or whatever it is, approach them. Get them to be part of your network. Get to know people. So the more, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just say this. Um, I've had a, uh, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, young alumni come up to me and say, you know, uh, I got my job through the most unusual way. I didn't get it through the career development office, and I, I didn't get it by sending my resume out. I went to uh, some event, and I just started walking up. To, I walked up to somebody, and we started talking, and the connection was made. So get out. Go to bar events. Join things. The more you get out, the more it will happen. I think it's, it, you know, it's interesting. So you're, you're just in your first year of law school, or just completing it, um, and you're thinking about this stuff. That's terrific, because that's what you need to do now. Um, uh, in my era, you know, we didn't start worrying about jobs until we were third year law students. But if you work on it now, if you're not complacent, if you start building that network now, by the time you graduate, you'll, you'll have the opportunities. So it's really crucial that you do this. Your law school is going to help you, but they can't do it for you. So they'll provide you with the doors, but you have to walk through them. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. Uh, um, well, that all happened in the middle 90s when um, every law professor in Los Angeles was employed by the media to do commentary on the O.J. Simpson case. And so um, uh, I, I had a great opportunity to work for CBS, uh, mainly radio. This is not a TV face. And, um, uh, uh, and it was terrific. It was like uh, I was the, we did live commentary, closed circuit um, uh, uh, broadcast from the courtroom. Uh, the, it was not carried uh, well. So we were doing live commentary on the radio like I was calling a baseball game. So that's what I did, and, um, uh, and then, you know, once one media outlet is using you, everybody else wants to use you. So that was fun for a while. So that's, that was how that connection was made. Uh, but really, uh, I'm a law professor. I, I've been a dean for a long time, but uh, I really see myself as, as a teacher. What else can I talk about? Well, I'm not going to call on anybody else. Yes, thank you. So you talked about the adversarial mindset that students will be taking the first sure. year and gaining perspective from that. Many times clients have an expectation when they hire a lawyer that they're, that they're getting. 
Yes. Um, sometimes that's not in the client's best interest. How can a lawyer change the mindset of the client so that the client can ultimately achieve the goals that the client may want without destroying a relationship, let's say, that might be in the way? Sure. So, to elaborate a bit on the question, the, the, the question is really uh, uh, reflecting a reality that a lot of clients think, will think of you as lawyers, will think of you as a hired gun, that they want the toughest, meanest uh, person to be their representative because they're absolutely convinced that the, the people on the other side are the scum of the earth and they need to be um, killed, eradicated, have every last stain of their existence removed, right? And so the reality is, of course, the folks on the other side are thinking exactly the same way. And what's going to happen is there's going to be some you know, awful lawsuit. Everyone is going to spend tons of money, not get anywhere, hate their lawyers, uh, and uh, everyone will walk away unhappy. Your job as a lawyer is to, is to stand for the best interests of your client, even when that may mean that uh, you're not going to get as large an hourly fee as you might because you're going to talk your client into trying to reach a settlement as opposed to taking this to a full, uh, full-blown trial. So that's, that's your obligation. And even though in the short term that might not um, pay off as much, in the long term it will pay off handsomely. Because in the end, your client, if you can bring your client to see what's in their interests, your client will remain your client. And you'll get more business. And, you, and the client will recommend you to their associates. So how do you do this? You, you have to learn to build the relationship. Your client has to come to trust you. That's absolutely key. And you know, most of us, hopefully, have not had too much uh, need to have legal representation. But everybody in this room has been to a doctor. Um, and what is essential in the doctor's office? Trust. You all have had the experience that uh, you've dealt with a doctor who you think is not giving you the time that you deserve, um, is not really paying that much attention. That's not a doctor you, you will go back to if you can avoid it. But when, you, when the doctor gives you the feeling that they're really out out there for you, they're doing their best. Uh, when you trust the doctor, you're going to do what the doctor says. It's the same thing with a lawyer. You have to you know, think about that relationship you had with the doctor that you trusted. What was it about that person that made you trust them? That's what you have to be uh, in dealing with your clients. Same thing. What else? Yes. How do we manage entering a profession that there's general distaste and hatred for and the industry and the legal profession in general? Like, how do we Right. Um, and how do you manage yeah. through those conversations? With sure. Well, one, uh, so one, one aspect of reality to keep in mind is the person who said, if I was king, I'd kill all the lawyers unless I needed one, <laughs> right? So once that person needs a lawyer, boy, is that person going to want a lawyer. Uh, and, and so that's the key. So look, um, w uh, the fact is we're never going to be loved by most people. And the reason for that primarily is 
most people do not understand what we do. They really don't understand it. And also, you know, drop in a footnote, there are plenty of bad lawyers. There are plenty of lawyers that are not applying the, the lessons that they should have learned back in kindergarten. Uh, so there, there's that. So as a profession, we, we have to keep that in mind. But as a professional, that's not how you're going to act. And you don't need the entire world to believe that you're wonderful. All you need is your clients to believe that. And so you have that in your control. It's in, it's in your hands. Uh, and, and if you do that and you convince those, uh, uh, you know, hope, I'm sure thousands of clients in the future that you will have that you're somebody to be trusted and really upstanding, then you've done your little part to bring the profession up in the eyes of the rest of society. So, but look, being a lawyer is tough. A lot of people won't trust you. You're going to have to, you're going to start not from um, ground z from zero, you're going to start from below zero and you're going to have to build up from there. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, this, this is, uh, I can tell you, you know, I've lectured at a lot of law schools, American law schools and schools around the world. And um, uh, all law students, wherever I've been, really w have the same questions and want the same things for themselves. And I feel very positive about handing the profession over to this generation. Uh, you folks don't have it easy. Uh, you don't have it easy, but I think you're more grounded uh, in reality than my generation was, and I think you can do a great job bringing up the profession in the eyes of the rest of society. So I'm very optimistic about where things will go, but it, it really truly is all, is all in your hands. So look, I want to thank you for uh, welcoming me here today. I wish you the very best of luck on your final exams and through the rest of law school. And again, remember, flush. flush. Thank you.